Hey, good morning. How are you? Cool. It's so good to be here. I got to tell you, getting ready for this was, was just a lot of fun. Besides being nerve-wracking, it's kind of fun when you get to speak to people that you kind of know and they kind of know you. Um, but I got to tell you, when I was thinking about this day, I decided I just I had to put on my old tourism hat for you. And it's, it's an old hat. I worked at tourism quite a long time ago. But I got to tell you that um, I, I'm still there emotionally with what we did with South Dakota. And, and I want to say to you that as I look at this room, look across this room, I truly do see, are there 400 people here, Diane? Close. It's, it's a good-sized crowd. And I got to tell you, I see a room filled with great faces from so many other great places that have come to this great place that I love so much called South Dakota. So welcome. Give yourselves a round of applause because you came a long ways to get here, and we appreciate that so much. Thank you. We're here to talk about leadership. Leadership in your world. Leadership in every part of the world matters. But leadership here, I got to tell you that um, I'm really proud of what you guys and gals do as leaders of this industry. You gather. Once a year, you gather in a place like this. And a long time ago, in 1985, you gathered here in Rapid City for Congress. That was two years before I was involved in your world um, with South Dakota tourism stuff. And so I wasn't here at Congress in 1985, but some of you were. If you were here in 1985, please stand up. If you were here for Congress in 1985, please stand up. Please give these folks a big round of applause. And thank you for being leaders all these years. Now, if this is your first rodeo or your first Congress, please stand up. This is your first Congress. Please stand up. Remain standing. Give them a round of applause. Keep standing. Now, because we're all such great leaders here, look at these people. Note who they are. Do not stalk them. Do not hunt them down. But engage and connect and say welcome to Congress. So thank you for coming. Welcome. I hope you have a great Congress. <laughs> great faces, great places. That's the theme for this state. It became the tourism theme when I worked for South Dakota Tourism. Do you ever wonder how marketing slogans come about? Anybody ever worked on one in an in organization? Well, you all know about the Aflac duck, right? OK. Well, Aflac duck came about as, as an accident. They were doing focus groups to find out what they should really be promoting about that insurance company, the products and services. And so they did focus groups. After the focus groups, the female CEO of the organization was in the restroom hearing people talk about the focus group that they had just been part of. And all, the only thing the women in the bathroom were talking about was the duck. The duck was cute. The duck was this. The duck was that. And she goes, they didn't talk about a single product, a single service. They just landed on the duck. So they used the duck. And can you all say it together, Aflac? Aflac. Everybody can say Aflac, right? OK. Well, in 1988, we knew at South Dakota Tourism that we needed a slogan. And so we were also going to use focus groups. And we had come up with a couple options for the focus groups to really talk about. And my personal favorite of the two was South Dakota, land of giant visions. Because, you know, Guts and Borglum did a pretty cool thing, right? I mean, that's not a, that's, you know how tall those spaces are? My trivia for the day. 60 feet, 20 meters. And, and so that's pretty big. How many of you have seen Crazy Horse Memorial? OK, those 60-foot faces, those four, they all fit in just the head of Crazy Horse. That's how big Crazy Horse is. So we have these, these people who have these giant visions for carving mountains, which is something we seem to do out here. And, and besides that, like the Oahe Dam near Pier, that's the second largest earthen dam in the world. So we have this state of giant vision. So I thought that was a pretty cool option. The second option we wanted the focus groups to consider was Dakota, spirit of Dakota. And we had been using Burgess Meredith's voice. Remember him, 
the coach in the Rocky movies. We used his voice on several TV spots, and he could say, Dakota, South Dakota. He could get so low, it was pretty cool. So we could imagine his voice with that one, right? So we have the focus groups, and they're, they're talking about those too. But in a focus group like that, frequently you have a third one that they can just visit briefly and then kind of throw away and get down to the serious topic that you want them to look at. This was the throwaway. <laughs> The one that they chose was the one we thought that they would just throw away. Great faces, great places. I learned an awful lot about leadership while I was at South Dakota Tourism. I learned a lot about this, this very example. Leaders do not know it all. We don't. It really pays to listen to your customers, your members, the people who are with you in this organization, sometimes the people who are not with you. And, and the fact that this was created in 1988 and still stands today is proof to leadership that said, we're going to make it last. Now, there are several ways to make things last. One is you create standards and you put it everywhere. The other is to carve that sucker in granite, <laughs> which is what we did. <laughs> so it's, it's there, it's lasted, and, um, and it's a, been a very, very cool slogan. Your leadership journey involves snowmobiling, billing. It involves so many days out on the trail doing things that you love to do. It involves you being a leader at the club level, at the association level, Congress level, in the industry, developing programs, leading programs, so much that you do as leaders. So I thank you for all that work. Your leadership journey is one that I think connects the past, the present, and brings you into the future. Everything you've done in your life, well, most everything, we won't count everything, but everything that you've done in your life can help you be a really great leader because great leaders are just good people who show up every day doing and being their best. So when you look back at your past, you think about the things that you've done back there. Can anybody find me in this picture? The far right, not, not the blonde on the other side. <laughs> this is from this, the tourism days. You think about our past and all the things that you've done that you've learned. Think about the first time you became a leader someplace and, and how much you've learned since that first time. And everything you've learned back there, you bring into today. You bring into the present. You bring into the meetings. You bring into your gatherings. You bring into how you lobby. You bring it with you to today to really work hard to create that, that future for all those kids and all those grandkids and, and their kids and grandkids. So the first thing we're going to do today is um, you're not just going to listen to me because that would be not as much fun as if you talked to each other. So I'm going to have you form a partnership at your table. Partnerships are very important in the sport, so find somebody that you can talk to. Now my best advice is that if you are sitting next to your spouse, do not Pick your spouse as your partner. I think it will help make your marriage last longer. <laughs> okay? So pick a partner. Pick a partner. Somebody besides your spouse. Pick a partner. <laughs> I know. Sorry. <laughs> and, and here's what I want you to talk about with your partner. I want you to go back and share the first time you became a leader. The first time you stepped up, maybe it was in high school, college, church, job, but sometime, the first time you became a leader. We only have about 30 seconds per person, so just kind of hit it and share. When did you first say, yep, I will try my best to be a leader? Go. <laughs> Thank you very much for doing that. Now, I got to tell you how I assess what just happened. When you thought back to that first time when you were a leader, the energy in the room just kind of went up. Hopefully that was a positive experience, and hopefully you kind of keep that in mind as we work through our leadership journey today and, and throughout this entire week, because you're with me more than once, okay? The 50-50 rule. Now, I know this group knows how to do the 50-50 raffle. If I asked everybody to put a buck on the table right now, you'd start reaching. You'd put a buck on the table. Don't do it. I'm just pretending. 
and then half of whatever you gathered would go to some good worthy cause like the Legal Defense Fund or something like that. The other half would go to somebody who won the raffle, right? So I know you know that. So I want you today to think about the 50-50 rule for leadership. And that's this. It's, it's not just what you accomplish. It's how you get there. And when you get there, and you got there in a way that you inspired others to join you, and you helped others reach goals with you, and you developed more and better relationships along the way, and you developed the courage to never give up, when you do it that way, you've done something very magical in leadership. And you don't have to be an off-the-charts great, great leader to do this. You just got to be who you are, the best of you every day. I'm going to show you how to take that journey today. So keep in mind the 50-50 rule as it comes to leadership. And by the way, I think this is going to be something that corporations are starting to use. A client of mine that's an energy company, um, you know, how many of you have been through a performance appraisal sometime in your life? Now, wasn't that just fun? I mean, root canal or performance appraisal, right? Well, this friend of mine who's an attorney in this energy company told me a couple months ago that they changed their performance appraisal systems so that now every employee in that company gets appraised half on what they accomplish, the other half is on how they do it. So I think that's going to be a new trend in leadership. And so you guys are trendy, you just didn't know it. You're very cool. So. To help you with the how, you have on your table a gift from ISC, a copy of, of a book I wrote called Journey Words. You know, I don't know how many millions of words are out there in the English language, but on, on my journey as I try to help people do and be their best, I've kind of zeroed in on, on a few words. And I'm kind of also maybe a bit of a word nerd. I don't know, I like words. I like the power of words. And so I picked out a bunch of these started writing these years ago and just kind of condensed what does this word really mean and how do you make it real in your workplace. About six years ago, one of my clients um, used 42 of my words for a book for their 20th anniversary. And after that, I decided to, to add 10 more to that list and create my own book. So it's for you to use. Please bring it with you tomorrow um, if you come into the session on, on club building, and please bring it back Saturday morning because we're going to have some fun with it. We're also going to use it this morning. So that's yours, and I hope you do use it. It's, it's for customer service, but just remove the word customer and replace it with the word member. As leaders, you've got to inspire your members. That's your job, and it's your job to make them want to be part of you and want to make everything happen in snowmobile building. So it's really designed to inspire and to teach and give you some solid tips. Okay, so I hope, you, I hope you like that. And can I give a round of applause to ISC for doing that? Thanks, Diane. But before we get into the tips, we have to acknowledge that there's always challenges in life. And sometimes they look like this. Now, have you ever been lost on a trail? Just me? Yeah, I'm usually at the back end, never even trying to catch up anymore, right? So there's all kinds of challenges that we face in life. Sometimes it relates to government. Now, I'm not here to bash government. We have lots of friends that are in government. But after I went to the fly-in in DC this past April, I see there are a few challenges related to government, right? <laughs> just a couple. There's also challenges related to sometimes, as leaders, you just don't know what to do with a situation like this. Imagine that. How are you going to fix that one? Isn't that amazing? I mean, it's a real picture somebody sent me somewhere along the line. Sometimes we don't know what to do. And sometimes one of our challenges is, by the way, this is Ed's first computer. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to pick on you. You sit right here, it's so easy. <laughs> but technology can challenge us as leaders. Um, but another real serious challenge sometimes is, is thinking that we're cool when we're not. Now, this is a very popular item. People who have seen these have started ordering these from me. And the first order was placed by Diane for Greg. <laughs> yes! And Greg, would you please stand up? No. no. <laughs> well, when Greg wears these, they're going to be in pink, OK? And he will look mighty fine. <laughs> yeah, you are. 
Um, sometimes I think, and some of you have already heard me say this, just shut up, Dee Dee, just shut up, Dee Dee. Sometimes the best thing to do is just to keep our mouths shut as leaders and just let things flow. I know that. It's just hard for me. And so this is my better solution. <clears throat> it works. <laughs> it works to change glasses. Yes, it does. Um, and then if you could substitute this car with a snowmobile, isn't this what we really want to do as leaders? We just want to have the full tank of gas, a great friend, and just go ride. And that's what that's all about, to be able to have days like that where we ride. I believe that there's a lot of similarities between being a parent and being a leader. And if you're not a parent, you're at least an aunt or an uncle, or you've got friends who have had kids, right? So everybody in this room has got little kids in their life. Remember that moment when this little kid came into your life and you wanted to be a really good role model because you were the mature, wise adult? Well, some of us thought that way. <laughs> well, I wanted to be that kind of a mom. And these are our daughters when they were quite little, three and seven. By the way, the first time Kelsey rode in the Black Hills in that orange snowsuit, she didn't like the sound of the machines. And every time we went to pick up her orange snowsuit, she started to cry because she knew it meant going on that loud machine. Guess who helped her overcome that fear? How many of you know Sandy Van Deest from Trails Head Lodge? Sandy's the one who got Kelsey to go riding because she wouldn't do it with us. Well, we were living, I had started working in South Dakota tourism in March of 87. And that summer, in living in Pierre, we were getting ready to go to church one day. And if you're a mom or a dad, you've had those moments where you get the kids all ready. And because they look so good, you just know that you're really a good parent, that you've got your act together, right? So I had one of those moments where I looked at both of my daughters, and they had on um, sundresses and clean um, anklets, clean shoes. They had their blonde hair pulled back in these cheap little plastic breaths we used back then. And they just looked so good that I told myself, oh... Yes. You've done it. You're a good mom. Because we don't want to be a bad mom. But you have moments like that, so you really cherish those moments when you think that you've done it and you're a good mom. Off we go to church. And it's just your basic Lutheran church service, so there's quiet times and there's noisy times, right? The little one, Kelsey being three, would stand in the pew sometimes so she could see. And Kelsey stood in the pew that day when only the minister was talking, grabbed her dress by the hem, pulled it up around her neck, and very defiantly said, I don't got no panties on. <laughs> and she didn't. <laughs> there wasn't a stitch on that butt. And you know, I learned a lot about life and leadership that day. One, I learned for leaders, for all of us, it's so much better to be humble than to think, oh, yeah, I'm cool. You might be cool, but you've got to be humble about it because humility makes it easier to inspire others and to do so authentically, right? And the second thing I learned that day was that I had a lot to learn. I thought I had my act together. And as leaders... I think that's one of the greatest positionings you can take as a leader, that you are always learning, because that makes it easy for others to learn with you. And don't you have room for everybody to keep learning and growing? As the issues change, as things happen, you have to keep learning and growing. And the third thing I learned that day was that no matter how badly I wanted to crawl under that pew, that wasn't the option for the mature, responsible adult that I was supposed to be, I guess. I couldn't crawl under the pew. I had to keep being her mom. Leaders, you face tough stuff. In this world, you've got some serious challenges. You can't quit. You can't ever quit. You have to. <laughs> Your fault. <laughs> you have to keep going as leaders, OK? You have to keep going, and you have to do so focused half on what you get done and the other half on how you do it. So, one more um, slide. Who recognizes this character? Tom Hanks and the name of the movie? 
A League of Their Own. Anybody seen that? Isn't it? It's a great movie. Remember when he got the job, Jimmy Dugan, this alcoholic, cantankerous old guy who was kind of crippled? And he didn't want to be the manager of this team because it was all girls, girls playing baseball during World War II. And there's a scene in that movie where I'm not sure who he's chewing out, if it's Madonna's character, who it was, but somebody he was being chewed out and they started to cry. Remember that? And he says, there's no crying in baseball. And then he says, when she says, but it's hard, it's hard. If it wasn't hard, everybody would do it. It's the hard that makes it great. You are the ones who show up. You are the ones who are tackling the issues. Is it hard? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. If it wasn't hard, everybody would be in this room, and they're not. You're the ones who are here. You're the ones who care enough. You're the leaders. So congratulations to you for being on this journey. And I have these four words, journey words, that are in the book that I want you to think about. I want to share with you how the things I learned about these four words being at South Dakota Tourism. I was really, really lucky. Do you ever have those jobs that just, they're just out of the world? How many of you have had a job that just went, yes, it was the best job ever? That was probably it for me. I, and I didn't know it. I was <clears throat> 34 years old, kind of youngish, I guess, a lot younger than I am now. And Governor Mickelson had been elected in November, was inaugurated in January. I started in March. He was a big guy who managed to make us all believe we could do this. We didn't even know what the hell we were doing. He just made us believe that we could do it. And I think about how you inspire people to do things. I look back at how he did it, and a lot of it had to do with his humility. One of the stories that you'll see in the book, one of my favorite Mickelson stories, he, he was a great storyteller. He just loved it. I think he taught us with his stories. But one day he was out here in Rapid City speaking, doing something, and he drove his own car, and he was putting gas on his car, and then he walked into the gas station to write a check, check writing days for him. And the cashier in the gas station asked him for his license plate number. And he said, well, it's, it's one, because that's what the plate is for the governor of South Dakota. But he said, it's one. And she said, oh, come on. What's your license plate number? He said, really, it's one. She goes, really? How did you get that? How did you get that? His answer, just lucky, I guess. See, I think for leaders, <clears throat> When you have the humility to say, yeah, I am lucky. I am lucky to be a leader of the snowmobiling industry, of the snowmobiling sport. I'm lucky to be a leader in the programming, in the trail development, and all the stuff I do. This is such a huge blessing. I am blessed. I am lucky. I think when you have that view, it makes you a person who can inspire others more easily. <clears throat> I think we, um, Mickelson also really lived this one. It wasn't about, I'm the governor, I'm in charge. It was, let's do it. Let's make this stuff happen. And so the key really is influence, not, yeah, I've got the gavel. But another place where you can find inspiration, I think, is from your kids and your grandkids. Raise your hand, please, if you have little people like grandkids in your life now at this stage, and great-grandkids, yeah. Well, I even played pirates with Gavin which, you know, and I wasn't really a pirate type of mom. Well, I had two girls, and they didn't want to play pirates. Gavin's the boy. I now know boys are different than girls. <laughs> That's what, that my grandson taught me. So we're playing pirates and having a great time. Well, shortly after this picture was taken, Gavin and his family moved from Cheyenne, where we were all living, to Coeur d'Alene. Anybody here from northern Idaho? Coeur d'Alene area? It's beautiful. It's incredible. So we go up there and um, took took um, Jess and Gavin to the store to get groceries to stock up for the week. And some of you have heard the story before, but Gavin's in the shopping cart facing me as his mom is off in the frozen food area. And Gavin picks at the plastic cover on the handlebar of the shopping cart. And he looks at me and he says, can we fix it? And I said, uh, no. <laughs> I pressed it down. 
he picks at it again and he says, can we fix it? I said, Gavin, Gamma doesn't have any tape or glue, so no, but it's okay, we don't have to fix it. Press it down again. A third time, he picks at it and says, can we fix it? At that moment, my daughter walked back from Frozen Foods and she said the infamous line, yes, we can. That's how I met Bob the Builder, my grandson's little cartoon character who was telling him, yes, we can. And I had been trying to talk to adults to get them to believe that, yes, you can do stuff. And yes, you have to believe that you can do this stuff or you won't be able to inspire others. So to get here, I want you to talk to your partner for a minute. I want you to think back, who inspired you? Who's the person who made you believe you could do more than you thought you could do? Who's that person who said to you, yes, you can? And you find your partner this time. Bill Manson, where are you? Okay, I gotta take care of Bill. Whoever has the least amount of hair in the pair goes first. <laughs> gotta take care of you, Bill. <laughs> Whoever has the least amount of hair goes first. Oh, by the way, if you have a threesome here, it's legal today. I'll let you do that. But so please talk for about a minute. Who is that person? Who inspired you to believe you could do more than you thought you could do? I believe you all got pens in the back of your Woody's name thing. So if you could grab one of those pens on page 82 of the book is the word inspiration. And there's one of those um, pretty cool mountain scenes next to it. I'd love you to write down the name of that person on that page so that you remember and keep with you in your head and your heart the person who said to you, yes, you can. Because that's a really important person, and I hope if they're still alive, you can say thank you. If not, send it upward. But let them know that you appreciate them. Because as you appreciate those who inspired you, you're in a better place to be that person who inspires others. Okay, so that's page 82 of the book. Great leaders really are just good, good people who show up every day willing to, to be their best and to do their best. And that's what I call this authentic making your journey great. That started out for me as a marketing slogan and it had quickly became just a life slogan that if we make that decision every day to be and do our best, we've got a chance to make a difference in the world. And so leadership really does start with you and you being inspired. And, and the inspired look I would hope that you would have is one of a smile. So please just turn to each other and smile one time. <laughs> smile like you really like the person next to you. Because you do. <laughs> and if you think of how simple a smile is. The smile is one of those simple things that cuts across all cultures and it encourages people. So when you're inspiring people, if you do this, you know, as we'd say in South Dakota, that dog don't hunt very well. So you want to be the person whose body language also says, yes, we can, and encourage others to believe that, okay? All right, give me the <laughs> He's going to wear them. He's going to wear them. So the next word I want to talk about is, is goals. Because what we have to be inspired to do is to reach some of our goals. Now, in Mickelson's era, the lesson I learned about this was the power of a very clear goal. Some of you have heard of the governor that, was, that preceded Mickelson and followed him, Bill Janklow. When Bill Jenkel was governor, he had a statewide tourism task force, industry-wide, got together, lots of meetings, and came up with what they call the Blue Ribbon Plan for developing tourism in South Dakota. 
the big goal of that plan that Mickelson then adopted and said, yes, we can. And we said, are you kidding me? But yes, we can, he said, we can reach, uh, we can turn tourism into a billion dollar industry. At that time, it was like a $520 million industry. He wanted it doubled during his eight years of governor. Now, the economics of that are pretty impressive, actually. I think anytime you double an industry in that time, but we actually got it done. We, not just tourism, we worked with everybody that we could work with. We got it done in six years. And so we got the billion dollar goal, but the beauty of that goal was that everybody could say it. What's your goal? A billion dollar industry. What's the goal? Billion dollar industry. Everybody in every organization knew that goal. The legislators knew that goal because they knew what that goal meant. If we reached that kind of goal, for every dollar they spent with us helping promote South Dakota, they got between $14 and $17 back in their tax coffers to spend elsewhere. So we weren't really a very bad gig, were we? <laughs> it was a good investment, and that's what we said, this is an investment. So I don't know what your goals are, but I'm sure that those of you who are in clubs, you've got club goals. I'm sure you've got association goals. I'm sure you've got goals in your programs, goals in the forest, goals in the trail development, goals in trail grooming. The goal of leaders is to be, be so inspired that you help people share those goals with you and know that, yes, you can. You can do this. Your goals might be related to, and I know you've got goals related to access, that you always have places to ride and places to go. And I know that safety is always one of your goals. But when you're reaching your goals, you got to be positive. This positive energy that you had when you, when, you know, when you talked about who inspired you and who, when you were first a leader, that's the kind of positive energy leaders need to inspire other people to get on board with the goals and to put energy towards it. Mediocrity doesn't inspire anybody. But a commitment to something that's cool, like the billion dollar industry, you know, access here, club membership building here, whatever it is that's your goal. When you're positive, you've got a much better chance of getting people to say, yes, yes, we can. So my question for you, and the word goal is on. This is in alpha order. Thank you, 66. If you would go turn to page 66 to write it down, but I want you to first of all share it with your partner. And pick a goal, pick one area. Maybe it's club, maybe it's trails, program, manufacturing, whatever it is. Maybe it's the goal for Congress. <laughs> Woo. Whatever it is, I want you to verbalize that with your partner. Now this time, whoever is older gets to go first. We're gonna pay our respects. <laughs> so delicately figure out who that is. <laughs> Use your inspiration, be nice. <laughs> When you have a goal and you, a goal is just another way of saying, what, what, what would we do? How would we make something better? How would we take something good and make it even better? Leaders are never afraid of that question, by the way. How do we make something better? Leaders embrace that and say, we can always, we can always get better. So remember that great leaders are, are good people who have some sense of where they want the organization to go. You might call it a goal. You can call it also a vision, your vision for things. Maybe you want, you know, whatever it is you want, more members, more access. You've got to have a goal that you can verbalize. And the power of the goal is going to be when everybody in this sport, in your clubs, wherever it is, understands that and can verbalize that goal. It gives it a lot of power. Okay? So... When Mickelson gave us that goal, I was, again, quite young and quite naive. I, I so thought, I so believed that if a governor gave a department a goal, along with the goal would go something called money, <laughs> budget, <laughs> something that would help you do this stuff. Mickelson seemed to have other ideas. I think, looking back, Mickelson actually believed that government could be more efficient and effective. Raise your hand if you agree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it was like, I think it was his way of saying, get better at what you're doing. Same philosophy that Jack Welch used when he downsized GE. 
He took it from 400 some thousand employees to 250,000 employees. He was criticized for that, but he also said, I didn't expect people to do more work, I expected them to work smarter. I think Mickelson said, work smarter. You can do this better and more efficiently. Well, one of the things you do when you don't have the money to reach your goals is you need other people. And so we got really good at this one, thanks to my boss. Um, her name then was Susan Edwards. She's married now, Susan Johnson. And she was the relationship builder of all time, I swear. She was great. How many of you remember Susan from stuff? Yeah, she's great. And so relationships just became the way we did things because we didn't have the money. So we had to make, let's say, a lot of friends. And in the snowmobiling world, of course, we looked at what was going on in the Black Hills and we said, hmm, can we promote this? Well, we had a governor who loved to ride, by the way, and Mickelson was kind of cute. Mickelson loved to ride with his kids. And Mickelson was a little embarrassed when, let's just say his sleds were rearranged on the trails. <laughs> he came back to Hardy Camp a couple times with sleds not appearing the same way that they did when he took them. <laughs> But the guy loved to ride and he kept riding. So we had his support and we had, we had partnerships with game fishing parks and the forest service and the, and the people who had the places on the trails and Black Hills Badlands and Lakes and I mean the manufacturers. The manufacturers were one of our huge partners back then. I think we got very good at saying here's what we're trying to do. We're really trying to promote this sport. Can you help us? Can we work together on this? One of the things we did was look at what the sport actually meant in the Black Hills. We did one of those economic studies. And we found that people said, we asked this question, do you plan to come back to the Black Hills next year? And the study showed that 65% of the riders plan to come back next year. And if you know snowmobilers, when they say that, they probably already had the trip planned, right? So that number was so high, we had to redo the study to verify some of the data. So we redid the study the next year. The number changed to 68%. <laughs> so we knew we had this thing that was, was popular. And so we worked together with everybody to, to try to promote it. And even back then, worked with Game Fish and Parks and I don't know who all else, but we created a safety video. Some of you maybe have seen it called Romancing the Snow. Well, it was, it was helping people, it was a tool for people for clubs to use on safety training and it gave us a chance to say how wonderful this area is. You cannot do it by yourself as a leader and anytime you think you can, you're operating from that space called ego and it's not very good for you or for anybody else. You have to think about who do you do it with. And leaders, when you do that, you are embracing others. You get a chance to tell your stories and, and find what's important to your partners. And so this is really a win-win-win-win-win deal with all your partnerships, all your relationships. And it's a great way to get more done than what you can do. Because, well, raise your hand if you have all the money you need. Raise your hand if you have all the money you need. Anybody? Oh, good for you. Can you share it? I'll take some. <laughs> because we don't have all the resources we need. So this question is very serious. I want you to think and share with your partner. Now think about wherever it is that applies to you. Maybe it's a program, maybe you're a manufacturer, maybe you're a club, association. What's a partner that exists in your part of the snowmobile world that you, you don't ever want to lose that partner? And what's a partner that you'd like to have? And this would be on page, this is for relationships, so can somebody find the page? Page 102. Oh, and that's my grandson with um, a golden retriever, imagine that. Talk with your partner about partnerships and answer this question. Who is a partner that you, you really value right now, you don't ever want to lose them? And who's somebody that you might want to get as a partner? Okay. Share that with your partner. And this time, um, whoever came the farthest to get here, unless you're with your spouse, and you're not supposed to be with your spouse, so you should be with somebody else, but whoever came the farthest to get here gets to go first this time. So talk about that, where you came from. I hate to cut off a good discussion like this, but I, I hope you take that back with you 
and, and remember who you, who you prize very highly as a partner. And remember those two magic words that leaders say often, thank you. Thank you for being our partner. Thank you for doing this for us. Thank you for working with us. What limits who might be your partner? I think really only your creativity. Get out, of, bless you, get out of the box and think about who might want to share the trails, share the program, share something about it. Who else can benefit from it? Because really great leaders will think about what's in it for both of us, not just for you. And so you make it so that it's pretty easy for them to say, oh, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Great leaders are good people who get really good at building relationships. And you take all your skills from all your life. Now, men, I know that we talked about 50-50 earlier. Um, it doesn't apply to your marriage, OK? <laughs> you should be really used to that by now. 90-10 is very fair for us. But as leaders, again, we're going to go with 50-50. So, so relationships is one of those really important journey words, and, and so is this one, courage. I think about courage. I think about Mickelson being this, oh, God, he had guts. He just, was, he just believed that he could make a difference for the economy of South Dakota. He believed he could do that. And so, you know, we fed into that as being tourism because of this thing. Gosh, I mean, how many states would just kill for this? This is known worldwide, and we could promote it. We could make it part of our marketing slogan. So we had, he had the courage to say we could do all this stuff. He never quit. He never quit. But he died in a plane crash in six years into his, year, into his office. Six years. He died. He was a, he, you know, still a fairly young guy, and he had these college-age kids. And, and what I learned even in his death was that we had to keep going. We had to keep going. We had to find that courage to just keep going. I think about other examples of that, and I'm not a real World War II history buff, but I, I've always been amazed by Winston Churchill as a leader during that era. How many of you agree with that? And some of his words about never giving up, I, get, I don't know how many days London was bombed, but it was like a lot. And he, he went out with these messages about just don't ever, ever, ever give up. And that's perseverance at its core. And then I think about, I hope we all have an example closer to home about not giving up. And for me, that would be, um, I click, please, please, my dad. <clears throat> my dad grew up in the Great Depression era of South Dakota, um, which meant hard times on the, on the farm. And at age 17, he thought it was a good idea to join the army. <laughs> I teased him about that later, saying, God, Dad, that was your great, that was your first job. Way to go, you know? Whew. <clears throat> As a kid on the prairie, my dad could shoot a gopher with a slingshot. Now, I don't know, I'd never shot anything with a slingshot, but I think he was pretty good. And he was a really good shot. So <clears throat> when he gets into the Army, you know, he's like, well, he's trained to be a good shooter. He was trained for two areas, two possibilities at that time when he joined. His first tongue was Norwegian, his first language, because his mother came from Oslo. So dad was trained for the Norwegian front or to fight in the desert, which I assume was the Sahara. Guess where they shipped him? New Guinea. <laughs> and I thought, boy, dad, you really signed up for a good trip there. I mean, this kid from the prairie, think about that. Going from the prairie to New Guinea. Well, late in my dad's life, I saw a movie called Saving Private Ryan. How many of you have seen that movie? Yeah. <clears throat> I've seen it once. I can never see it again. Because I, asked, I told my dad about that movie. I told him about the invasion and, and the boats. And my dad goes, yeah, that sounds about right. That's what we used. I knew he was this island hopping guy from New Guinea to Helma Hare to the Philippines. But I didn't know any of the details. And I wish, I still kind of wish I didn't. But I think about my dad um, not quitting during World War II, despite hell. And um, I, think about, I think about being in London. If, if I was in London during the, the um, bombing, I think I would have moved to Ireland and started drinking Jameson. Was it around then? <laughs> I would have made whiskey. I would have done something. I would have tried to get out. I would not have had that kind of character or courage or perseverance to be in London being bombed to pieces. 
I would not have had the courage of my father to be in World War II and do what he did. I, I wouldn't have done that. But I think getting it even closer to home for each of us, we all face our own loss. And sometimes that loss is in, is in death sometimes. I mean, my mom died suddenly and that was really hard. Dad died 14 years later, that was hard. But then I think we also, in this room alone, you have faced things like, some of you have dealt with the word transplants, cancer. Um, lots of things have happened in your world, accidents. And what we learn through it all, what I have learned through it all is that it is always about putting that one foot in front of the other, again, and you just keep going. You just keep going because you can't quit. And you as leaders in this world, you, you can't quit. Now I know some of you are thinking that it's getting time for retirement and you don't get to until you've trained at least two or three other people to be as crazy as you are, <laughs> okay? You can't quit. This is just too important. What makes it hard to keep going sometimes are those challenges, and they're huge. You, you do face big challenges, but you, look at you. Look at the group in this room. You are great leaders, because you're good people who are inspired, who, who know that relationships matter, and who've got the courage. You have lived through a lot, and you haven't quit yet. So you just have this power to keep going, and I hope that you have the power to know that, you know, somebody modeled this for you. We don't really have time to do this today. But somebody modeled this for you. So, you know, think about who is that person. You know, my dad never giving up when I think it would have been easier to give up. Um, when you face hard stuff to keep going, keep building relationships, sometimes when you hear no, but you got to keep going. So, what I hope you say at the end of this session today is that you want to inspire people and that you want someone to look at you and say, because of you, they didn't give up. They didn't give up the fight for access. They didn't give up the fight for better programs, for better machines. They didn't give up anything. They kept going. And I hope that you know that great leaders are you. You're good people who show up every day being and doing your best. That's all anybody can ask. But when you do that, when you do that, you're doing something very special that sets you apart. So I'd like to close with um, um, uh, the follow-up story to my daughter's. I don't got no panties on. By the way, she did snowmobile with panties. That was a progress. <clears throat> so did I. Okay, so did I. <laughs> but um, in terms of, of not giving up, you know, um, I, I, I hope to live to be a really old broad. As I, I tell my grandson now, Gamma is an old broad. It's a, it's a good way to manage his expectations of me. So I, I plan to be an old broad, and I plan to hit the ripe old age of 92. I just picked that age. I was at the age of my aunt. And when I hit 92, I'm going to throw a party. And you'll all be invited because, you know, what the hell, we'll also be alive. We'll be having fun somewhere, someplace. But the party's going to be probably be in South Dakota, so you have to come back to South Dakota for this party. And it's going to be in the summer. And we're going to start that, and we're going to have it on a Sunday. Um, so I, I can take my family to church. And so my family's going to go to church, and I'm going to wear a dress. <laughs> and I'm going to have my hair pulled back in little breaths. I'm going to have some anklets on. And um, when only the minister is talking, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to put my cane away. I'm going to drive, grab my dress by the hem. <laughs> and I'm going to pull it up around my neck. <laughs> and my daughter will never be the same again. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today. I hope you have a great Congress.